Hey carnivores, welcome back to the channel. It's me, Bella the Steak and Butter Gal. As always, I would love to know how you all are doing on your carnivore journeys. Feel free to drop an update down below in the comments. To cap off another amazing month of the carnivore way of life, I've condensed some of the very best moments full of advice and knowledge featuring superb carnivore doctors and experts who joined us in the Steak and Butter Gang recently. We've had some incredible medical professionals at the top of their fields sharing their insights, tips, and best recommendations. And I can't wait to highlight all of their best wisdom for you in this video. So grab your favorite cut of meat, sit back, and let's dive into these doctor approved carnival roundups together. Meat and fat are never going to be inflammatory. And that's the main takeaway is that these are, if you are sick, you need to remove inflammation. Or if there's something wrong, it's caused by inflammation. So you go back to what the human body evolved to eat, which is animal fat and meat. Uh, there's no nutritional value to carbohydrates. Why would we need them? We didn't evolve to have them. There's nothing in our body that runs better on carbohydrates. So why would our hormones? We know very well that they're all made out of peptides, which are proteins and, and cholesterol molecules to make steroids. Carbohydrates are, are a cheap form of energy. It's like diesel gas compared to, I don't know, Tesla batteries, you know, very dirty and smelly and yucky. And you're not doing your endocrine system any favor by eating them. You're definitely not helping your hormones. High cortisol is very inflammatory. We were taught when I was in school, we were taught to be very careful, to ask all our patients, had they taken had cortisone shots? Because if they had had cortisone shots, we had to be very, very careful touching them because their bones were very fragile. So think of what cortisone does to bones. It burns nerve tissue. It's inflammatory. So the body doesn't like it. So it will eventually, if you're always running those ultra marathons or fighting people three times your size like I did, or, you know, eating lots of carbohydrates, lots of coffee, lots of stimulants, you will have high cortisol levels. And eventually the body will just turn it off. Any kind of stress state, healthy change state, you need a lot of fat because that is the best. Your, well, your adrenals, your adrenals use fat to make uh, cortisol. Uh, everybody who has stress needs to eat more. Male and female need to eat more fat during times of the stress because you're burning through the cortisol. You're just, you're running out of gas. How do you fill that tank back up? You add the fat. The fat is what makes cortisol. So you can re, you can lower the high cortisol by eating the fat. There are studies that have demonstrated that during their intent, this is high intensity uh, exercise. Um, the cortisol levels are high and they tested people on carbohydrate diet, high carbohydrate and high fat diet. And the people with a high fat diet recovered much more quickly. Their cortisol lowered faster. Their muscles, everything recovered much more quickly because the cortisol went down. Mm -hmm. So fat lowers cortisol. What we want to have is a system that says, okay, I'm hungry now. Okay, I'm not hungry now. That's all we need. That's normal. We would just want to be normal. We want to be healthy. And if our hormones are functioning, pro if our hormones are telling, sending all those signals properly, that's how you'll be. You'll just be hungry when you're hungry and eat until you're not hungry anymore. You can't heal if you don't eat fat and eat meat. I mean, if I was 15 years old and eating 500 calories a day and I go and I eat, you know, steak three times a day, I'm sure I'd gain weight. I mean, that's just, that's just normal. If you're eating cookies and pancakes and I mean, those things are uh, going to make you sick. But if you start eating steaks, you might gain some weight just because your body is finally is saying, wow. We finally have what we need to fix your heart, fix your kidneys, fix your brain, all the stuff that we need. And now we can get to work. So let's buy all the materials, go to, I don't know, what's the hardware store there? Home go Depot. to Home, Home, De <laughs> Home, Depot, Home Depot, buy all that stuff and let's build shit. <laughs> and that's what it is. All of those hormones are, are made from cholesterol. So not avocado oil. Mm -hmm. Made out of animal fat, made out of, not out of coconut oil, God forbid, made out of animal fat. So these, these fake fats, you can't make steroid hormones out of those and you can't regenerate brain tissue or cover myelin sheaths, nerve tissue with those. You can only do it with animal fat, which is what our body's made out of. There's no avocado oil in our body. The, uh, the animal fat is what our hormones are made out of. And what I, what I 
pointed out in the book is that the thyroid actually directs all this. The thyroid, we always say the thyroid is the the uh, the conductor of the orchestra, the, of the hormones being in the orchestra. Bipolar syndrome or anxiety, depression, gray hair, uh, skin issues. I mean, it just all kinds of illnesses, Raynaud's syndromes, Deputrin's contracture, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, all of these things are related to hypothyroidism. They're associated with it in research papers, but when you go to the doctor with something, you're not going to be, they're not going to check your thyroid unless you're obese, coal is a fish, and comatose. Or your eyes are bulging out and you can't gain weight and they're going to think, hypothyroid thyroid cancer. When you go to your doctor, unfortunately, they're often very arrogant. And they may think they know something and they will say, oh, don't go to Dr. Google and things like that, because there's a lot of uh, pride involved, right? So you have to advocate for yourself. You have to say, this is associated with hypothyroidism. Would you please look into that? I think this is what it is. I mean, when you go to your doctor, you, you have to say, this is what I think it is. You need to do this test. Eating a carnivore diet is going to be very, very helpful in the healing process. Not only will it help you to heal because it gives you the building blocks, but it's likely to, to limit the uh, inflammatory response you get. You know, back when I was doing like knee replacements and stuff, and I had them on low carb ketogenic diets, I wasn't doing carnivore at the time, but I still noticed a remarkable improvement in, in, in the amount of decreased swelling and decreased wound issues and pain that the patients often have. You know, for some people, variety is something that helps them be to, to sustain this diet. And like I said, if I told everybody, the only thing you're allowed to eat is a, is a plain bowl of ground beef for the rest of your life, no one's, I would not sign up for that. No one signed up for that. And you'll figure out what, what treats you well and what doesn't, you know? I mean, the biggest thing is getting that bread off your plate or, or getting, or used to having that sort of, I got to eat my fruits and vegetables. And so once you get used to just eating animal products, that's really a, a big step. While I am a huge proponent of diets, um, I think there's other levers, you know, I think exercise, sleep, uh, circadian rhythm, you know, six, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, respecting that. I mean, moving around, eating windows can be helpful, depending. A lot of people on carnivore tend to eat infrequently. Most of us eat twice a day. Some do OMAD, some do a little bit more frequently. And uh, sometimes moving that window early in the day has been helpful. I have played and I sometimes advocate for what I call fat cycling, where it is, you know, a little bit of lean proteins for a couple of days and then putting the fat back in rapidly. Cause you can't, you can't do, I mean, I know there's protein sparing modified fast that some people advocate for. And I mean, really, I found that gosh, any more than about three or four days of that. And you start to, you start to, you start to become, you start to crave things. You start to, your thyroid starts to, you know, when you deny your body adequate, I guess, nutrition in a way, your body starts to shut down non-essential things. So it says, okay, well, if you want to play that game, guess what? We're going to make you tired and you're going to be less, you're going to move less and you're going to be colder and things like that. So to prevent that, it's important to periodically kind of refeed, I guess. And so I think that can be, um, you know, and again, 80, 20 ground beef and, and eggs and ribeyes is, you know, you're probably looking at 70, 75% fat, probably if I had to guess what the, pre the, 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 the ratios are on that. And so maybe rolling at 60% for a little while. In my experience, between about 60 and 80% fat is where most people sort of survive on carnivore long term. And then shifting it one way or the other for, for either therapeutic reasons, perhaps more high fat, or for body composition reasons, perhaps a little leaner, are, are reasonable, reasonable approaches here. I eat when I'm hungry and I don't eat when I'm not hungry. And that and that ultimately turns into kind of an intermittent fasting thing, but I think it's very natural. And you know, at a point. I think that makes sense. I mean, I think for some people that are struggling with satiety cues and maybe they have a history of food addiction or morbid obesity or something like that, then I think that that little crutch of, you know, counting your time can be helpful. It can kind of train you to not eat as frequently. And I think that can be a helpful way to do that. But I think, I think the natural sort of just, you know, you know, satiety and hunger cues probably will lead us to, if we're eating the right diet, right? I mean, if we're eating pop tarts and Twinkies and Reese's peanut butter cups. No, you're going to be wanting to eat constantly. So I think the diet that lends itself to infrequent meal patterns is probably kind of appropriate. I, I, you know, I talked about this years and years ago. I said, you know, I think if you're eating the right diet, you kind of naturally just don't eat that frequently because you think about it. If we make the argument that we were all at one point nomadic and hunter gathering and stuff like that, I think there's pretty good evidence that we did. It would be very inconvenient to be breaking for meals you know, frequently six times a day. I mean, you know, particularly if you think if you had to start a fire and you don't have, you don't have a microwave, you don't even have silverware or pots and pans. I mean, you're, 
I mean, you're probably cooking over a rock, you know, somewhere and it's, you know, so it's, it's not very convenient. So I suspect most humans prior to kind of civilization were probably eating very intermittently and, you know, eating a lot probably. And I used to talk about feasting and fat, you know, intermittent feasting as, you know, you load up on food and then you don't eat again. On the note of feasting and fasting, the Steak and Butter Gang offers an amazing protocol that all members can easily follow to start carnivore and thrive on carnivore. It very much focuses on the concept of feasting and fasting. And we incorporate our special priming protocol that Coach Raymond and Coach Emily teaches. If you need a guide that you can clearly and easily follow to help you get on track, heal and reach your weight loss goals, I highly recommend you check out our next challenge to access our full feasting and fasting program. We will be having Dr. Anthony Chafee, Dr. Robert Kiltz, Dr. Tony Hampton, and Coach Rebecca Heishman. For more details and to directly join us before we kick off, feel free to go to the URL shown on the screen, sbgmeetup.com, or check out the links down below in the description box. There's quote unquote perfect, and always the enemy of good is perfect, right? I remember in surgery, we would you'd like to get this thing just perfect on the x-ray and you do this and all of a sudden you you break something, you know, and it all falls apart and like crap, you know, trying to be perfect all the time is, is, is going to end in, in, in sort of disaster for most people. So you do what you have to do. You do what you can do. You do what it makes a state. So you said you feel good. So that's, that's already a win there. So, I mean, I think you're in a, you're in a good place. And I think, like I mentioned about earlier, when it comes to losing those last few pounds, it's, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard work for me. I mean, even, I mean, you guys see how hard I train and stuff like that, but I still have to knuckle it, you know, to lose those last five pounds of, you know, lower lower belly fat i mean i gotta really grind to, to get there and so and the question is it even, isn't even worth it so your body is really not concerned about how you look in the mirror until you get all of those deficiencies taken care of and so that that could be part of the reason why you haven't noticed a change on the scales i would highly advise you to do two things first get a tailor's tape you can buy one for three bucks off amazon and start taking your measurements just like you're going to get measured for a suit of clothes and many, many women on keto and carnivore find that their, their inches are going down long before the scale starts to move. In many cases, when a woman starts to eat a very nutrient-dense diet, she'll immediately, even though she's burning fat, because she's in ketosis at least some of the time, she'll also start to put on muscle and her bones will start to strengthen. Both of those things show up on the scale in the bathroom very often. Uh, masking the fat loss that you actually are having by the increase in muscle mass and the increase in bone mass. And so that's, again, that's why the Taylor's tape is so important because you can see these body recompositions happening, even though the number on the damn scales may not be changing. If what you're doing is not working after the third month, don't call it a stall. Don't come at me saying my weight loss is stalled. If it hasn't been three months, I don't want to hear it. You need to give your body time to heal. You know, some women take a month. Some women take three months. Some take six months or longer before their metabolism calms down. The inflammation calms down to the point where their metabolism's like, okay, I guess everything's okay. I guess we can start to metabolize some of the stored fat. You need to shut up and grow up and get on with it, okay? It takes time for your body to heal. I love you. That's called the slap hug. We study science and we work on science and we try to make discoveries, but very often we find out, oh, that discovery I thought I made was, was complete horseshit. It was completely wrong. So we got to go back to the drawing board. And we're seeing this happen in real time in nutrition science right now. If back in, in the, the 1980s, early 90s, if you had said, oh, you need to eat fatty red meat and egg yolks and, and, and eat sticks of butter, I mean, I would, I would have literally immediately lost my license. Literally, we could line up 20 million people, just like me and Bell and Emily. 20 million, line them up. Here's their labs. Here's everything. That still would not be enough data. They'd be like, no, you need a 20-year study. And it's like, bitch, do you have a 20-year study? I'm going to eat uh, Reese's Puffs every morning because you said it's a green light food. Has that been studied for 20 years? Hell No. But that's okay. That's different because they're tough school of nutrition and policy. And I'm just Dr. Barry here in Camden, Tennessee. I don't think we're going to change their mind. And that's why I don't even want you to waste your time. I want you to find the people that you love, your family, your friends, people that you, you like. I really like that guy. He's got potential. That's the person you're going to reach out. To. The, the great tragedy in my mind is the, um, the, the therapies that are offered to cancer patients 
are ba are based on the conventional knowledge that cancer is a genetic disease. They don't realize that it's a metabolic disease. It's not a genetic disease. So, um, and I don't think they know that. Uh, they haven't been trained. The field, majority of people in the oncology field uh, are are not aware of that. And it becomes clear uh, when they discuss this uh, with their cancer patients. It probably goes down as one of the greatest uh, tragedies in the history of medicine. And it's not, and, and nobody's lying to anybody. They just put all their eggs in a singular basket, and that basket has happens to have a huge hole in it, and 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 we're not we're not getting the benefits of all the billions of dollars that we have invested in this disorder. The theory under which the disease is viewed and managed is incorrect. It's a metabolic disorder, and once you realize that, we'll be able to drop the death rates by fifty percent in five years. But you have to uh, overturn a monstrously powerful system and paradigm, and that. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Look at your glucose ketone index, and that tells you uh, what level of, of nutritional ketosis that you're in. Once you put the body in this new metabolic state, these tumor cells become extremely vulnerable to very mm -hmm. small doses of various whole array of different kinds of drugs that go after the glucose and glutamine. Cancer cannot live without glucose and glutamine. There's only oh. two fuels. We've, we've interrogated the cancer cell. We, here's what we do. We take these tumor cells and we put them in saline, which is a salt solution, no fuel, nothing. And then we see how long it takes them to completely die. Without yeah. fuel, remember, without energy, nothing can survive. Energy yeah. is everything. The whole cancer issue is energy, energy, energy. Mm -hmm. So how do you know what a cancer cell needs to survive? You grow it in salt and then it, di it dies. It, oh. it dies. And then we add stuff back one at a time, one at a time. And we find the things and all of a sudden you add glucose back, boom, this thing starts growing again. Even in the wow. salt, there is a requirement here and it's called personal discipline. Uh, yes. You have to have some level of discipline to get your glucose ketone index, yes. which, which could take uh, on, a, on a very low carbohydrate diet and you can use any kind of a low carb diet you'd like. It might take 14 days to get into a, a GKI. It's an elegant, a beautiful, non-toxic way to get rid of cancer. But it does require the patient to participate in the outcome. Just like every animal, we have an evolved species-specific diet that's biologically appropriate for us. And you venture outside of that and you can actually get harmed. The vast majority, if not all, of the so-called chronic diseases that we're treating now nowadays as a mainstay of modern medicine are a direct consequence of eating an inappropriate diet. We're eating things that we're not biologically designed to eat and we're getting physiological harm from that. And this is manifesting in different ways and we call it diabetes and cancer and heart disease and autoimmunity and dementia. But I really think that it comes down to the fact that we're eating things that can be directly harmful to us and disrupt our physiology and biochemistry and manifest as these sorts of diseases, these non-communicable chronic diseases, which are getting worse decade after decade after decade. So this isn't genetic. This isn't just always been there and we just didn't notice. That's a very foolish statement. Going on a carnivore diet is at least removing a lot of different things, like removing cigarettes or alcohol. You're just removing another cause of harm to your body. And what we see people do is they reverse their diabetes. That's been clinically proven with any ketogenic diet that you can do that. Autoimmunity. I mean, I've never seen anything respond better than a carnivore diet to uh, for autoimmune diseases, including all the different biological agents that we have mm -hmm. to treat autoimmunities. And, and so many more. You know, we're getting more data about how high cholesterol in the ketogenic population with only mass hyperresponder mm -hmm. evidence that's come out, data has come out from Dave Feldman. And they've found that, no, you don't actually develop atherosclerosis, even though your LDL is massively elevated in this population. And I don't think in any population, because I just don't think for a second that LDL is a causative agent in heart disease, simply because the studies that originally said this is associated with it were bunk. You know, they were, they were fraudulent. They actually showed that they were inversely related. So the less cholesterol people had, the worse heart disease and heart attack and stroke they had and vice versa. So when heart disease became the number one killer in America, we were eating the least amount of meat in America that we had in 200 years. It was sort of a U-shaped curve from the early 1800s to the late 20th century. And right at the bottom of that was the 1920s and 30s when this became the number one killer in the world. And in fact, it went down. We were actually eating slightly more meat 
when the first heart attack was proven on autopsy and we went ate less meat and now it's the number one killer. So that doesn't even, that's not even an association. There is no association of people say, well, throughout the 20th century, meat consumption has gone up and heart disease has gone up. Mm -hmm. Fine. Look directly before that. There's no association whatsoever. So this is nonsense. Saturated fat sort of stayed consistent throughout the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Heart disease has gone up. Mm -hmm. Animal fat has actually come down mm -hmm. as heart disease is going up. And we replace it with other sorts of fats and things like that as well. So this is a, this is a fraud. This is, this is clearly a fraud. There is no association at all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the top cardiology journals are recognizing this. If you're still using artificial sweeteners, then that will absolutely keep, right. will keep your, your cravings going. And, yes. and even things like milk and things like that. I have to be careful around milk. Yeah. Because, I mean, I, I, first of all, you know, we're talking about like sweetness. My palate has changed so much. So like the sweet sensation mm -hmm. is much different. So I, if I, if I drank like whole milk, it just mm -hmm. tastes like I'm, drinking ice cream like the same right. experience. I'm like oh my god it was right. so sweet it's amazing and obviously you want more of it yeah. and then you raise your insulin which drops your blood sugar which blocks your leptin and it makes mm -hmm. you feel like you're starving so you need to eat and your blood sugar drops your ketones drop and you feel tired and horrible and mm -hmm. lethargic so you drink more milk to raise your blood sugar and you play that whole game mm -hmm. and so you can easily drink more and more and more and more milk and then you can get back into a sort of a carb addiction. And even though drinking milk may not be the best idea for all carnivores because it can potentially spark those carb and sugar cravings, there is a great alternative and that is colostrum. This is Armour's colostrum and there are over 400 bioactive naturally occurring nutrients such as peptides, antibodies, and antioxidants that are all jam-packed into each serving of this colostrum. Their unflavored version is also 100% carnivore, it's ethically harvested from grass-fed cows, and is purified for seamless digestion. Digestion. You just take three full spoonfuls of the colostrum, mix it in a room temperature or chilled drink of your choice, drink it down and you are good to go. Both Steak and Butter Guy and my older sister have been using this daily to help with their immune system and to boost hair growth. When you drink it down, it has a very pure milky flavor. There is no stevia, no additives, no flavorings, just 100% unflavored colostrum. If you're interested in Armour Colostrum, you can all receive 15% off your first order by going to tryarma.com slash S-B-G-A-L. You can also enter my discount code S-B-G-A-L at checkout. I've also linked them down below in the description box. Alcohol is another killer for this. Mm -hmm. People, what, every couple of months or eight months or something like that, they're like, oh, this is stupid. I want to go out and drink. Alcohol has been shown to lower your inhibitions for eating crap food. Mm -hmm. And uh, even when people are on just a normal standard diet, they're more likely to eat a lot of the processed, highly you know, garbage sort of foods. Right. And so this is a major, major, major uh, way that that people going on a carnivore diet or any healthy diet they can end up falling off of that is because they they drink alcohol and then they go oh well maybe i'll eat this other stuff and they start eating a bunch of garbage and and they're just like well i guess i can't do it I and mean, these things are a drug and they can be addictive and you can have cravings because of that and that's that's pretty typical after about two three weeks that usually goes away mm -hmm. if it's several months in it's probably you're hungry and your brain's telling you hey you need to eat if you go into a grocery store and you smell the bread aisle and the yeah. bakery and you go oh my god that smells amazing you're hungry like right, that's all there is right, to right. it so you need to eat but you don't eat bread you eat real food like meat. And there's also the argument to be made that there are a lot of bacteria in our guts mm -hmm. that are reliant and dependent mm -hmm. on carbohydrates and fiber. And when they start dying off, they start panicking and they start actually sending chemical signals up through the gut brain connection into your brain. You start getting very strong and severe carb cravings and sugar cravings. And so when your microbiome is turning over and dying off, that you can actually get quite severe mm -hmm. cravings because of that. What we don't want to do is be so afraid of a dietary pattern that seems a little extreme that is helping so many people, particularly for autoimmune disease, uh, neurodegenerative diseases like dementia and Huntington's, and things like uh, metabolic health, and of course, mental, particularly mental illness. So I think what we have to do is combine what we do have anecdotal uh, uh, res uh, experiences, which is why I like the steak and butter game. We have all of these testimonials. We combine that with the observational research for carnivore. We connect that carnivore research to keto until we get more carnivore research. And then we, we take our personal experience. People cannot wait to heal. Uh, mm -hmm. if, we, if we wait for the guidelines to change, there will be so many people who will never heal because they've never heard this information. 
their doctor hadn't heard this information, their nutrition professional hadn't heard this information, and therefore they won't heal. Did you know that uh, saturated fat, uh, when it comes to randomized controlled trials, is not associated with heart disease? Not only is it not associated as suggested by the Journal of the College of Cardiology, it's actually protective against stroke. So they would hear that. Oh, by the way, did you not know that when the uh, World Health Organization suggested that this this uh, red meat was harmful for your risk for cancer. Did you not know that every study that was looked at, it was about 14 of them, they were all observational studies which don't show uh, you know, uh, causation. They only show possible association or correlation. And when it did increase your risk eating bacon every day, buy a piece of bacon for like for the rest of your life, it only went up like, you know, from five to 6%. So would you not eat bacon if it only went up from five? And most of them say, I'm still gonna eat my bacon. So so once you give them like some evidence to say, this is a little exaggerated, this is something that's really not something you should be concerned about, they're willing to uh, then take that leap. When you prepare people and they have firm goals, why am I doing this in the first place? They have a why and they're comfortable with incremental change and 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 we're gonna notice all the improvements. It's not the scale today. We're gonna focus on the A1C today. We're gonna focus on the triglycerides going down. Give them something else to focus on. Oh, just the fact that you just feel better. I feel better, Doc. Well, that's that's a victory. We don't need a scale to change. To We're going to celebrate that. Oh, by the way, when your scale didn't change, maybe you gained a little muscle and you lost a little fat and it just balanced out. So you have to... So my job is to problem solve, be a little bit of a coach and just nudge them in the right direction, but never, never forget you have to honor where they are. Never look at a person and assume that they struggle because they want to struggle. Do you know anybody that wants to struggle? I don't. They struggle because there's some economic issues. There are some uh, relationship issues. There are some social isolation issues. There's other things that make them struggle. Our job is to put our arms around people and say there are people that look just like you, who have the same resources as you, who have the same medical conditions, like you, and they've all healed. They move their body, they've reduced their stress, they, they've they recognized the other things. They, maybe they had trauma in the past and we didn't address it, so we're gonna address the trauma. And so we do all of those things. Now we have the recipe for success. And a year from now, they will be in a much better place. And I also remind them that struggle is part of the journey. So if you continue to struggle, you better expect to, that there's, there's gonna be struggle. Rather, it's something happening in another country, which is happening right now, or something happening in your own home. There, stuff's going to happen. And so your job is to not keep stuff from happening. You have to change yourself so that you can handle those struggles when they occur. And that's all we can do because they're going to keep happening. I really, I really think that that's the way we have to manage through life because otherwise we're going to put too much energy and too much power into other things we can't control. And if we do that, we will always fail. I want to have control over Tony and, to, and, and, and accept the things I can't control. And I think if we do those things, uh, that'll be enough. That's the good news. It'll be enough. Because if you just do that, you'll be doing more than the average person and you'll overcome most of the things that have been barriers in the past. Our next 30-day carnivore challenge is open within the Steak and Butter Gang. We will be having Dr. Anthony Chafee, Dr. Robert Kiltz, Dr. Tony Hampton, and Coach Rebecca Heishman. The Steak and Butter Gang offers an amazing protocol that all members can easily follow to start carnivore and thrive on carnivore. It very much focuses on the concept of feasting and fasting, and we incorporate our special priming protocol that Coach Raymond and Coach Emily teaches. If you need a guide that you can clearly and easily follow to help you get on track, heal, and reach your weight loss goals, I highly recommend you check out our next challenge to access our full feasting and fasting program. For more details and to directly join us before we kick off, 
feel free to go to the URL shown on the screen, sbgmeetup.com, or check out the links down below in the description box. I hope you learned a thing or two in this jam-packed video featuring some of the most amazing carnivore experts that you can trust. These days, information flows too fast for most of us, and it can be really hard to know what to listen to and what you just have to block out. There's a lot of misinformation, naysayers out there, but the best thing you can do is to believe in the steps you're taking to reclaim your health and join forces with like-minded peers and mentors who can celebrate the ups and downs with you. If you're interested in seeing what this looks like, check out last week's video linked right here where we had a really fun time reacting to a New York Post article written all about my carnivore diet. It was an amazing conversation and round table with my steak and butter gang team. We all had a laugh over what major news publications seem to think about the carnivore diet, and I hope you'll get an idea of how to respond to any kind of hater who doesn't support you on this amazing journey that you're on. Thank you all so much for watching the video, please don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and turn on your bell and notifications to not miss my future videos. I'll see you in the next one. SPG out.